My name is Bob Belkin. I'm a professor of the practice of biomedical engineering and global health at Duke University. And I'll be talking today about biomedical engineering, a little bit about also how you can get involved with an organization called IRI. So let me just start telling you also, I forgot to mention global health. So I'm a professor of biomedical engineering and global health at Duke University of Americas. So I'll be talking about both topics a little bit. Let me start by telling you a little bit about my background. My background was biomedical engineering. I graduated with a degree in electrical engineering and worked as a biomedical engineering, biomedical engineer. The first project that I worked on is the one that's in the left side of this slide, part of a heart-lung machine. A heart-lung machine, of course, is a device that's used when a patient is undergoing surgery that requires access to the heart. The thing that you see there on the left is the patient control Pitchner temperature control module. So the doctors usually lower the patient's temperature during the surgery to make the outcomes better and then raise it up again at the end of the surgery. Literally before this device hit the market, patients, doctors will move buckets of water. So they use a bucket of ice water and flow the blood through the bucket of ice water to cool the patient and then stick it in a bucket of warm water to warm the patient up. This new device allows uh, doctors to have a warming profile, a cooling profile, really improve the situation in the operating room. That was one of the first devices that I designed. It's actually still in use today in many operating rooms all over the world. I then moved to Switzerland. One of the great things about being an engineer is everybody needs an engineer. They're, they're needed everywhere. So you pretty much can always find a job in pretty much anywhere that you want to. I wanted to move to Switzerland. I worked there on pacemakers and defibrillators. Pacemakers are things which help the heart go faster when it's not, and when it's going too slow. And defibrillators are things that help the heart go slower when it's going too fast. So I did this. I also worked a little bit on watches. Watches and pacemakers turned out to be very similar designs. So I designed the electronics for the Omega Seamaster there that you see on the right. I want to take a minute here and just give you a little insight on uh, external defibrillators. Um, that's one of the devices that I did a lot of work on when I was younger. And there's a lot of mathematics and all of engineering, here, but I wanted to introduce just a small smidgen of it to give you a sense of a small amount of a sense of what goes into something like this. A question that comes up very early in defibrillator design is how much power do the devices need to have? more power, the more challenging the design. So an early question is, you know, how much power do they need to deliver? Turns out that an external defibrillator, I'm sure you've seen these things, the doctor puts them on the chest, like that picture in the bottom left-hand corner, you know, it's clear, and the patient jumps off the table, hopefully restoring their heart to a normal rhythm. Is it definitely a life-saving device? They deliver about 350 joules of energy in around six milliseconds. Uh, power is the amount of energy delivered per unit time, so joules per second. So we can directly calculate what the energy, what the power is of the device, 350 joules divided by 6 milliseconds at 0 0.006 seconds. That's 58,333 watts. In other words, a defibrillator delivers about 58 kilowatts of power. That's more than your own takes. In fact, that's more than half a dozen Homes take. So this is a huge amount of power. People don't sometimes realize the people later deliver a huge amount of power. It is for good reason that the doctor yells clear before delivering that shock. They can really pack a wallop. So let me talk a little bit about global health. Global health is uh, the second field that I've been involved in in my career. Global health deals with population differences in health across the globe. Here's an example. This is obviously an image of the world, color-coded by the prevalence, or in other words, the percentage of the population infected with HIV. So the question here is, look at this graph, or the, the point I want to make is look at this graph. The difference across the globe is huge. If you look in my hometown, where my university is, where my office is in Durham, North Carolina, Population prevalence of HIV is like 0.1%. In other words, one out of a thousand, roughly. For my example, my 
Mary School at Duke University and about 1,200 students. So maybe we have one HIV positive person, maybe we have zero. But look at the southern tip of Africa. Their population prevalence can be like 30 or even 40% nearly in some isolated population. In other words, more than a third of the population is HIV positive. And imagine, you know, what that means for, for your life. What it would be like to go to high school if a third of the population of your high school was HIV positive. You know, well, how would that affect the sports that you play? Would you be um, wrestling? If you knew that a third of your competitors were HIV positive, how about baseball, football, rugby, how about the cafeteria or even the bathroom? It would affect everything in your life. This is what global health is about. Global health is looking at these massive disparities across the globe that really matter, that affect people's lives. I just wanted to mention when we say global health, we don't only mean health around the world. The U.S. is also part of the globe. And here's an example of a huge disparity. This is life expectancy for females and by county. So these are all the counties in the United States. Notice there are about five counties in the U.S. that have a life expectancy significantly less than your life expectancy. Your life expectancy is probably 80. A couple of them are indigenous populations, and some of them are here in West Virginia and Kentucky, molten coal mining towns. In fact, we have a project in one of those towns. So even in the U.S., you can see huge disparities in key health indicators. So the question that you know comes up is how to respond to this, how to respond in both an engineering sense, but also in a global sense. You know, how should we respond to these great differences that we see in global health? Lots of people that I work with and talk with start with their understanding with a graph that looks something like this. This is the per capita healthcare expenditures on the y-axis. In other words, the number of dollars spent per person per year on healthcare. And I simply divided up the world on the bottom to the least developed nations on the right, the most developed nations, on, sorry, least developed nations on the left, most developed nations on the right. And what you see is there is a 40-fold difference in healthcare expenditures, a huge difference in healthcare expenditures, something like up a thousand for the most developed nations and just $50 for the least developed nations. And there's a big difference in outcomes, HIV, health expectancy, and many other health determinants in it. So the answer must be dollars. Send money. And in fact, this is what I typically find people want to do first. When they first begin to believe me that there are these huge differences and they really do matter, the first thing they want to do is send money so they to fill the gap. You know, that might not work. Look at this graph. So this is combining a couple pieces of data here. This is average. This is a little bit older data, but it's average life expectancy on the left y-axis, and that's the vertical bars. And I'm just going to line up the first 20 or 30 nations of the world. And then uh, per capita healthcare expenditures, that's the squiggly line kind of cutting through the middle of this graph. What you should notice is there is one nation that spends way more on healthcare than anyone else. And this is actually old data. That's us. In the United States, we spend way more on healthcare, like a factor of 10 times more money than, for example, Cuba, our nearest neighbor on this graph, or our nearest neighbor physically. Uh, we spend 10, 10 times what they spend on healthcare. And notice we have one of the worst healthcare systems in the world, at least according to this measure of quality of healthcare. So at least this graph in any case certainly doesn't suggest that, you know, health spending more money makes a difference. I want to just show it to you one other way. We use a lot of statistics as well as other branches of math in engineering and in biomedical engineering global specifically. Now, this is all nations 
life expectancy on the y-axis, per capita healthcare expenditures on the x-axis. Notice again, one country way out to the right, that's the United States. We spend way more than anyone else. But what I really want you to notice is if you look at like countries that spend more than, let's say, $1,500, so like Singapore and to the right, actually, there doesn't seem to be a relationship between life expectancy and healthcare expenditures at all. That's a pretty flat line. It's called regression analysis. That type of mathematics is called regression analysis. That line seems pretty flat between Singapore and the United States. It might even be going down a little bit, meaning spending money, more money actually makes things a little worse. Also, if you look at the most, the poorest countries, so look at countries left of Namibia, for example, or left of Sierra Leone. These are countries that are spending $50 or something like that per person per year. Again, draw a line through the data. And again, there does not seem to be much association between life expectancy and the amount of money spent. That line's nearly vertical. Now, it is true in between those two. So if you look between Singapore and Cuba, for example, yeah, okay, there, if you regress against that data, it seems like there is a line there. But for the poorest countries in the world, the richest countries in the world, it does not seem to make a difference. That is not the primary driving factor, how much money they're spending on healthcare. Here's just an insight into why that is. Just one particular insight. This is, again, the least so low-income countries on the left, high-income countries on the right, leading causes of mortality. In other words, what are they dying from? Notice there's not a lot of similarity between these two lists. Look on the left, for example, malaria. I don't think there's been a malaria transmission in North Carolina where my little list is located. There are 100 years. Now, there's some overlap. Stroke appears on both of them, of course. HIV, that's a managed chronic disease in the U.S. There's not a cause of mortality associated with that in the U.S. The point here is they're dying from different things. So even if you send the money, there for malaria, for example, the one I brought up, there isn't a really effective vaccine yet. They're just this year rolled out one that may solve the problem. But up until now, there really hasn't been an effective vaccine for malaria. What are you going to spend the money on? HIV, there is no cure for HIV. Of course, there are treatments. Tuberculosis, uh, well, you know, there hasn't been tuberculosis in the United States in significant numbers in men here. The point is they're dying from different things. So what are you going to spend the money on? Now, I do also want to point out before I leave this graph, it's not that straightforward. Look at, for example, road injuries, road traffic accidents in the developing world, the low-income countries. That's the 10th leading cause of death. However, we actually have a lot of technologies for dealing with that problem. Seat belts, road, tra road signs, uh, traffic lights, street lights, asphalt brakes that work, airbags. They're just not being deployed. So... Again, you know, buy all the technology you want there. It's not being deployed. So this is a complicated picture for sure, but this gives you some insight into why just money alone is not going to make the difference. Okay, so perhaps I've convinced you, at least on the global health front, perhaps I've convinced you that there is a, a, a problem. There are huge disparities across the globe, and they matter. They affect people's lives. Maybe I've convinced you that just sending a bunch of money isn't going to solve the problem. The next most common thing that I find people want to do is they want to send medical equipment. And, you know, that makes some sense. Modern medicine is, in fact, very complicated. Lots of equipment involved. You know, uh, you can see in this picture on the left, lots of monitoring equipment, but also lights, x-ray, MRI, you know, labs, etc. It's a complicated, high-tech world. So it makes some kind of sense that you'd want to send equipment. Now, here's just a picture of an operating room to give you a sense of how complicated a modern medicine can be. But actually, that doesn't work very well either. These are pictures that I took uh, from hospitals. I have these pictures like this all over the world. Hundreds and hundreds of these pictures, perhaps thousands. 
This is all donated equipment, and it is not helping anyone. You can see the, the ones on the left there, top left, those are in boxes. Clearly that equipment's not helping anyone. The one on the right, the far right, this is a hospital that has received so much donated medical equipment, they've rented this huge building just to store it all. Clearly not helping anybody, it's just sitting there. This is what happens to donated equipment. According to the Director General of the World Health Organization, only about 10% of donated equipment ever becomes operational. And in fact, that's true for all donations, but this number has been confirmed by us in our lab many times. Donations are very, very ineffective and in fact can be dangerous. I'll just give you a quick story about the danger of donations. This is a study done by one of my students, Laura Perry, many years ago. Uh, it's still the largest study of its kind, 112,000 pieces of equipment. And she uh, took inventory basically on hospitals all over the world. She found 38% of the equipment was out of service, not that big a surprise. She also found that 95% of the equipment was imported. Also not that much of a surprise. Again, medical equipment is complicated, sophisticated. You need sophisticated tools to build it and things like that. Look at the flip side. 5% of the medical equipment is locally produced. So what happens if you donate in a category of locally produced equipment? And this is actually pretty common. So example, let's say you come with me. I do a trip to, I did a trip to Northern Tanzania every year with students. And you notice that there aren't enough wheelchairs. There is an insufficient supply of wheelchairs. Absolutely true. So you come home, back to your high school, you start collecting donated wheelchairs, collecting from your colleagues, your friends, your family, perhaps the hospitals, airports, I don't know where you get them. And you're successful. You get like 100 wheelchairs. You get them on a container, you ship them over to Africa, you fly over, give them up. The assumption is here, because you donated wheelchairs, more people have access. More people have wheelchairs. That is not true. Fewer people have wheelchairs now that you don't live them. Because six months or a year later, when your donations start to break, and they will break, everything breaks, your car breaks down, your cell phone breaks, your laptop breaks, everything breaks. When those wheelchairs break, the local population will know where to go. You put out of business the local provider of wheelchairs. Why would anybody buy a wheelchair when you're donating them? You put out of business the local guy who repairs wheelchairs. Again, why would anybody get a wheelchair repaired when you're donating them for free? So come six months later, a year later, fewer people have access to wheelchairs because of your donations. Donations can be tremendously hurtful. By the way, if you're interested in following up on this, I do have a TED Talk on this. You can just YouTube me and, and TEDx and you'll find the talk. One of the things that does help is direct intervention. I'll just talk through a quick story here. This is a trip I took to Sierra Leone soon after the Civil War ended. It was a cataract surgery trip. If you look on the left-hand picture, right dead center in the left-hand picture, you can see a woman walking up the stairs um, with her hair on her back. That's the surgeon. And everybody around her is the patients hoping to get cataract surgery on their eyes. I unfortunately could not wait during the first day to attend surgery. I had to go to a different hospital to do some inspections. When I returned, though, this little girl on the right was waiting for her grandmother. That didn't make sense. I knew what the docket was for the day. The surgeon should easily have been able to finish all the surgeries that day. So that little girl should not have been waiting for her grandmother when I returned. So, uh, you know, the question is, uh, why? Well, first of all, a little background. Reminder, Sierra Leone is a small African nation on the western coast of the continent. Life expectancy is very low. Mortality, all these data, actually, many of these things have become worse. Look at the under five mortality, for example. Under five mortality is more than a quarter. In other words, if you and you had two brothers and a sister, and you lived in Sierra Leone, one of you would have already been deceased by age five. 
And as I mentioned, something was wrong here. Now, cataract surgery, if you don't remember what that is or you don't know what that is, cataracts are very common. In fact, they're universal. If you live long enough, you will get a cataract. And have nothing to do with poverty or, or anything else. Cataracts are when the lens of your eye becomes opaque. It's relatively easy to fix. You can simply, uh, what the doctor does, makes a small incision about one millimeter in size, inserts a machine into that called a phaco emulsification machine or just a phaco machine. It emulsifies the lens and then it's sucked out. Now you can see, because the lens has become opaque, you can see. Once the lens is gone, you can see. However, you do need your lens. So the doctor rolls up a small lens called an IOL, intraocular lens, sticks it through the same incision, it then pops open. And now you can see perfectly. So 20 minutes, you go from not seeing at all, totally blind, to seeing perfectly. Very highly successful surgery, over 99% success rate. What had happened was one wire in this device that you see in the middle of this picture. This is a microscope, an XYZ microscope. It's what the doctor is looking through while they're doing the surgery. One wire in this microscope had broken. That shut down all surgeries for the day. They couldn't do anything without the microscope. I came back, of course, started working on the problem immediately. Pretty quick to fix the problem. Actually, it took me five or 10 minutes to fix the problem. It took me a little bit longer to train this man on the left. Paul, he is the guy who cleans the toilets at the hospital, but that's all they have. They have no technical staff. They have no engineers at the hospital to repair things. So he, I trained him on how to identify the broken wires in this old, old, old microscope and how to fix them. In fact, I've talked to Paul since the world's broken many times and I had to fix it. After we repaired it, it took maybe 30 minutes for the training as well as the repair. The surgeon got back at it and was able to finish the rest of the docket. And that little girl could go home to her grandmother at the end of the day. From this experience, I created two organizations that allow both high school students and college students to get into the developing world to help with medical equipment. One is called the Engineering World Health Summer Institute, still running today. Applications are open. This was started 20 years ago, but it's still running today. Applications are open for next summer already. I don't know which countries are on the list for next summer. I think we'll want to Guatemala and Tanzania. Great program. Thousands of pieces of equipment repaired by students. Uh, more than $25 million worth of equipment, all repaired by students. In fact, it's the largest provider of working donated medical equipment. Not that they actually donate the medical equipment, it's that they make it work. Another way that um, I well, respond is with designing new equipment, specially developed equipment for the developing world. This is a project from one of my students, for example. It's a device for treating hyperbilaluminemia, also called infant jaundice. Very common. I have two kids, both were born with jaundice. They were both treated the same way by being exposed to intense blue light, 455 nanometer blue light, breaks down the bilirubin molecule into a water-soluble form, and then it can be urinated out. Very effective treatment. Every hospital that, that has newborns will have these, but they require electricity. None of the hospitals that I work at have electricity 24-7, zero. So my students designed this device. It runs on a motorcycle battery. So if a child is born, power is out, you can just plug in the battery and treat the kid. This company is long since sunsetted, but before that, 35,000 children were treated with this device. Here's another device that got a uh, really nice spread in the New York Times if you wanted to read more about it. This is a colposcope. A colposcope is used for screening for cervical cancer. You might be familiar with the pap smear for uh, screening for cervical cancer. Pap smear is a, a system where the doc uses something like fancy Q-tip sort of, scrapes the cervix, sticks it in a tube, the scrapings, and with Q-tip as well, sends it off to a lab. It's then smeared onto a slide. It is, in fact, a smear stain looked at under a microscope. And if the cells are not shaped right, call the doctor back. The doctor calls the patient back. The patient comes in, gets treated. This is what we do in the world. 
this is totally never going to work. This is never going to work in the developing world. Many of the patients I have don't have phones though, that I work with. Many of them, the entire country of Guatemala, for example, don't have mail. They've never received something like a piece of mail. They don't have a postal system in Guatemala. There is no way to send post. And the patients are going to walk 20 miles or 20 kilometers for you to tell them their lab results are already. So this, this is never going to work in many settings. Colposcope allows a doctor to examine the cervix, treat the cervix right there if they have a problem. No need to send it off labs off. No need to bring the patients back in. No need to call them. My students designed the device. It's head uh, mounted, battery operated. And in fact, has uh, screened thousands of women for cervical cancer. Here's another one, also designed by my students. This is the PrEP pouch. This is a device for treating, uh, for preventing the transmission of HIV from mother to child. Remember, I mentioned that in some countries, 30 or even nearly 40% of the population is HIV positive. That includes pregnant women, and they are at very high risk of transmitting the disease to their child. However, that can be prevented if they are, if the child is treated immediately after birth. Not a big deal in the U.S. because people give birth in the hospital, they have the meds. It's a big problem in the developing world. 95% of the population of Ethiopia delivers at home. 75% of Tanzania, 65% of Malawi, and on and on. So it's a huge problem for nations where home birth is the norm. My students developed this uh, pouch. It's a drug delivery system that allows a mom to be given the meds long before, months before she delivers. And then if she delivers at home, she can just tear open the pouch and deliver the meds. Now you might ask, well, no big deal. Why, why don't they just give her a syringe full or a spoonful or cupful. I'm, I'm sure you've all had medicine when you were a little kid. Your mom gave it to you probably in one of those forms, a syringe, a spoon, a cup, or a perhaps an eyedropper. Problem is, all of those forms destroy the medication. And to get into why, let me just, let's just do a tiny bit of math together. It's not a big issue. And it's the same problem as with paint. You may have wondered, I'm not sure if you wondered, why is paint stored in cylindrical cans? You think about it, what a terrible idea. So why not store it in rectangular cans? So in cylindrical cans don't store well because you can't stack them tightly on the shelves. Stores could have a lot less space dedicated to paint if they could just have it in rectangular cans. Plus, I can't use the cylinder, cylindrical can. I have to open up the cylindrical can, pour it into a tray, and then from the tray, I can paint my walls. So skip all of that. Just give it to me in the tray. I'll tear off the top and I'll start using the paint. We well, can't do that. Many paint is, as the medicine is in this case, very sensitive to the surface to volume ratio. So it can only be stored in devices which have an appropriate surface to volume ratio. So surface to volume ratio is exactly what it sounds like. A cylinder has a particular volume that it contains within it. In other words, how many gallons of paint can be stored inside of the can. And then the can itself has a surface, the outside metal, typical, or plastic that actually contains the paint. What is the ratio of those two things? That is critical for the paint, for the substance of the paint. In other words, if the surface volume ratio is too high, the paint turns into a solid. In fact, that's how paint works. You paint it on your wall, raising the surface to volume ratio really high, lots of surface area, not much volume, and the paint turns into a solid. So we can do an easy calculation. A paint can cylinder is about eight inches diameter, it's about eight inches high. The volume internal to it, volume of a cylinder is given there in on the right hand side or on the about halfway up um, on the right. Um, it's pi r squared h. So that's how I did the calculation. That's 402 cubic inches of sort of volume inside. 
the area of the cylinder is the area of the outside walls and the top and the bottom added together. So that's the other equation that's shown there next to the cylinder. 2 pi r h plus 2 pi r squared. I did the calculation again ahead of time. That's 301 square inches. So that gives a surface volume ratio of about 0.75. As I mentioned, it'd be way easier for me if they would just sell me the paint in the tray so I didn't have to separately buy a tray and cylindrical can. Paint trays are about inches, eight inches by 16 inches by three and a quarter, roughly. That also has a volume of 402 cubic inches. So it's not a volume issue. Both containers contain exactly the same amount of paint, but the surface area is higher for the rectangular storage, 356 square inches. That's a surface volume ratio of 0.88, and that's too much. Some paints can't handle a surface to volume ratio. That's exactly the same problem, or almost exactly the same problem we have with the medication. All the things I mentioned, the spoon, the cup, the syringe, those all have a surface. For us, it was a volume to volume ratio, but similar to a surface to volume ratio, that was too high for the medication and it destroyed the medication. The Pratt pouch was designed with the appropriate surface volume ratio for that medication by my students. First of all, I started an organization called GPSA, still exists today, and in fact, next summer, applications are available for GPSA as well. GPSA is for high school students. I'm not sure which sites are open next summer. I believe the Guatemala and Belize sites are open next summer. Oh, and maybe the site in West Virginia as well. It's an organization that lets high school students immediately get involved in clinical activities. You can see the high school students on the left taking blood pressure. In the middle, they're looking at blood glucose. It's super important for diabetes. On the right, they're doing hypertension talk, so an educational talk about hypertension. Reading glasses is a big effort for those that are uh, unable to do fine work, like uh, sewing, for example, very debilitating for some members of the community. So we distribute classes, of course, do the exams, and then distribute the classes. And another organization you can get involved in is IRI. It's a relatively new organization compared to the other two. That focuses on high school students doing research, so fundamental knowledge generation. With IRI, you get to directly work with great faculty from American universities, and you get to publish your work in the scientific journals. This has got some tremendous advantage for your college applications. It really improves your college application strength. It demonstrates that you can do an extracurricular activity of depth and length. You can get letters of recommendation, additional certifications that can strengthen your application. And as I mentioned, publication, which really demonstrates clarity of thought and clarity of expression, um, as well as curiosity. These are things that we're always looking for in college applications. Just to give you a couple of ideas of what so that looks like, what students doing remote research. It's a completely remote program. You don't have to come to Duke University campus. It's completely remote. This is student Sanjana Anand that I worked with when she was a high school student in California. She was interested in the effect of vaping on the immune system. So she surveyed, I think, about 2,000 people, I think, if I remember right, about their vaping habits and their cold and flu symptoms, cold and flu symptoms being the surrogate for their immune system. And indeed, she found that uh, people who vaped had more frequent colds and flus. And the more they vape, the more uh, severe their cold and flu symptoms. Interestingly, although she set, set out to show thought that nicotine in the vaping pen would be the cause, it actually did not matter what they vaped. So presumably, this is the heavy metals being released from the vaporizer itself into the user's lungs, which are destroying the immune system. Still a larger study of this type. It was published two years ago. So and there are many others. And just an example. We have uh, two programs from IRI that you can get involved in. One is called the Research Assistant Program. The Research Assistant Program is long program. It's a year or two in length, so it's a significant commitment of your time. It's also a significant 
limit of time week to week, you become basically a full lab member. You attend lab meetings, you get to know your professor really well, and you work towards publishing new knowledge. You work towards publishing something new that nobody else has ever done. It's a major milestone. Um, we also offer the Introduction to Research program. This is a much shorter program, typically four to eight weeks most popular over the summer, although we actually offer it all year round. And you complete a literature review. Literature review is the first two steps of research. That's the first two steps for everyone's research. And you do that in the introduction to research program. You do mostly work with graduate students in that program, but you work with faculty as well. It's a great program. We also introduced a new program this year called the Data to Publication Program. It's brand new, just announced last week, in fact. This is kind of in between introduction to research and research assistant program. It's intended for those students who have already done a significant amount of work, perhaps, for example, a science fair presentation or something like that, where you already have a significant amount of data. Now you're trying to get that data published. Uh, it's a great program, a DTP program. Just a quick comparison here. Again, the research assistant program, 16 session terms. But remember, that's a year or two in length, so a lot of terms back to back to complete. The data to publication program, that's not shown on this slide, but that fits in between the intro and research assistant program. That's a brand new program. It is typically just one or two terms in length, so much shorter than the research assistant program, and it's for students who already have done some work. And then the intro program, which we have both the individual, which is eight weeks, express four weeks, those are identical programs, and the group program, where you work with a group to accomplish some research objective. Remember, that one's the literature review that you complete. Oh, we have great faculty at IRI. I won't go through all of these, but Dr. Laustis is focused on oncology research, Dr. Mills, aerospace engineering. Dr. Riles is in genetic engineering and biochemistry. Dr. Delaval is in nutrition. Dr. Antonelli is a theoretical mathematician. There is, as I already have demonstrated, I hope, to satis your satisfaction a couple of times here, there is a huge overlap between mathematics and engineering. Mathematics is the language of engineering. We talk to each other as engineers in math. Dr. Talon is interested in public health, global health, and epidemiology. That's the statistics side of things, also a branch of math of great importance for us. And as I mentioned, you work with great principal investigators, not just graduate students, if you work with IRI. All right, I want to wrap up here, and I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen in just a couple of minutes. I did want to mention that um, IRI has openings all right now. Also, I mentioned GPSA. That's the program where you can get involved in the clinical activities. That also has openings and is already looking for 2024 applicants. And I mentioned Engineering World Health also looking for 2024 applicants. Keep in mind that one is for college students, engineering students. If you are interested in IRI at any time you can apply, you just need to go to admissions at iri-nc.org. Okay, I want to stop sharing my screen now and open up floor to questions. Is basically the donated equipment more dangerous and stuff because more outdated and decommissioned when it's donated versus the modern technology as it is stands? Yeah, that is a great question. Fortunately, the answer is complicated. So let me take just a few moments to explain. Half of what you said is absolutely true. Much of the donated equipment is outdated. And this is really a problem. Most medical equipment, and this is true for our engineers, we design for an 18-month life cycle of the equipment. In other words, we produce a particular model of that, whatever it is, defibrillator, electrosurgery, PCCG, for 18 months, and then a new model is released. Just like cars, you know, every year they release a new model for the car. But at some point, those old models aren't supported anymore, meaning you can no longer get parts for them. So when they break, they can't get the parts. So this is a really big problem. Lots of donated equipment is outdated and you simply can't get the parts anymore. 
However, there is a problem with brand new equipment as well. So for example, a hospital that I worked at received 20 brand new ventilators. Those ventilators are programmed to stop working every six months unless you replace this one little part, a little filter thing that has to be replaced every six months. But it's not available in the country where they were donated. So they can't replace these parts and they can't do anything with the equipment. This is actually quite common now that the profit in medical equipment is the disposable, not the equipment itself. This is actually somewhat true even for your car. The long-term cost of your car could actually be the gasoline that you put in the car, not the car. You buy an inexpensive, small, used car, you can spend more on gas for that car than you actually spend for the car. That's true for medical equipment as well. Also, there are other reasons as well. I mean, just mentioned many countries donate, that includes the United States, many countries donate equipment without manuals at all or with the manuals in the donor country's language, not the recipient country's language. And imagine if I donated to you a laptop where the entire keyboard was in Cyrillic and the manual was in Farsi, you would be unlikely to be able to use the laptop. And this happens all the time. So there are a number of reasons why donating medical equipment is largely unusable. Certainly one of them is the one that you brought up. It's outdated and decommissioned work. What the success rate is from using ideas from the innovation group? Another awesome question. So I do have some data on this. I taught senior biomedical engineering for seven years at Duke University, two semesters. So that's twice per year for seven years. Every group started with around five to six projects. So that means about 70 to 80 projects started from those classes. 10 of those reached clinical trials of some kind. So in other words, or actually a little less, probably about eight. So in other words, around one-tenth, around one out of 10 projects reaches clinical trials of some form or another. Of those that became clinically available, meaning more than trials, but actually succeeded in trials and reached commercialization, about four of those, so about half that reached clinical trials actually reached, let's say, large scale, large being kind of a broadly used term here. However, I just want to mention that's actually really good performance. It is really hard to innovate successfully. The vast majority of innovations are never able to see the marketplace. It's probably more like one out of a thousand in uh, the medical device space in general. There's some reasons for that. Of course, I was selecting projects for the students and I selected projects that I think had a really good chance. We were doing things only for the developing world, so we didn't really need to worry about profits. And the medical system in the West, anyway, is profit-driven. So there are lots of medical devices that might help people, but you can't make money off of them. Those never reach market. And there may be some other reasons as well. But nevertheless, that's answering your question directly. About four out of 80, roughly, were ever able to reach let's say, large-scale implementation. What do you see as the future of medical technology? Is it moving more towards non-invasive technologies and biotechnologies? For example, cybernetic, prosthetics, neurological chips, implanted monitoring devices. That I know the technology you mentioned is a little far-fetched, but it's a question I have. It's a two- or three-parter here. So for the U.S., the driving force for the next probably two decades and maybe four decades is going to be cost, actually, not innovation. So the future of healthcare technology for the U.S. is technologies that can drive down cost. The U.S. is spending a huge fraction of its GDP, the huge fraction of its total amount of dollars available on healthcare, and there's a huge amount of pressure to reduce that. So. This is most recently seen in pharmaceuticals, but the pressure is also being seen on medical devices as well. 
So I think if you are interested in getting in the space in the US, the space that's really exciting is technologies that reduce cost. Things like medical records, electronic medical records, for example, can really reduce costs quite a bit. Um, hospital readmission rates are very expensive. So hospital readmissions are being looked at quite a lot and many other areas where cost is really getting a lot of pressure. So in the US, the next decade, two decades, maybe much longer than that, is not gonna be focused on introducing new high-tech devices. It's gonna be focused on largely reducing cost. Not to say that other things won't hit the market. We will see new devices, but new devices that have a lot of cost associated with them are gonna receive a huge amount of scrutiny and often high-tech devices are expensive when they first hit the market. In low-income countries, what we're seeing is the biggest change in medical device introduction is a change in the economic model. Common model that you're probably most familiar with for medical equipment is that a hospital buys equipment or, or even, the, even the doctor that you go to for a regular visit buys the equipment, scales, blood pressure equipment, light, of course, chairs and desks, computers, but also maybe laboratory equipment, examination equipment. They buy that equipment and then they use it to give you an exam or at a hospital to give you a piece of surgery or whatever, any procedure. That model is rapidly changing. I should say it's slowly changing, but I, on the scale of the developing world, it's rapidly changing to where hospitals lease that equipment. They do not buy the equipment, they lease that equipment. So clinical laboratory, for example, that's a big area. That's when you take a blood sample, for example, from you, the patient, send it off to the lab, and then it comes back with some answers. That's clinical laboratory. Clinical laboratory has changed from 20 years ago, 100% purchased, to today, only 5% of medical equipment is purchased in clinical lab. And it has gone from 80% out of service to 95% in service. So it's had a huge impact on the quality of healthcare in the developing world on patients. We're now seeing this in imaging equipment to where the doctors don't buy things like x-ray machines or imaging machines like an MRI or a CT. They lease it and then pay per slice. In other words, they pay per image that they take. So a huge change in the economic model in the developing world, and it's really rippling through all the equipment. Equipment is being redesigned so that it can meet this new economic model. In between, so that's the lowest income countries and the highest income countries, the US and the low income countries. In between, countries like Europe, all European countries, are just struggling to hold, hold the line. We're not seeing a lot of great technology innovation, probably for cost reasons, but innovation is just not that robust in the European context, as it was, let's say, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. You could argue there was a boom in technology innovation 40 years ago, 60 years ago, 50 years ago. Now we're in a trickle, just in a trickle situation. So a very complicated answer, but great question, Luna. Thank you for asking it. Is there anything in the job that has surprised you? Yeah, a lot. So let's just talk about a couple of things. Sort of the starting point of this conversation was biomedical engineering and mathematics. So let me start with something that didn't surprise me. Mathematics is just huge. I just cannot under overstate the importance of mathematics to solving the world's problems, at least for engineers. Everything we do is focused on mathematics. That's how we communicate. That's how we document the work. You really can't innovate to solve the world's problems without math. Surprisingly, relatively, in my opinion, relatively sophisticated math. So my students at Duke take at least three, well, at least four semesters of introductory calculus and then two additional semesters of advanced calculus at the undergraduate level. And then they'll additionally, if they go on to graduate school, take another four or six calculus classes. And that's only calculus. That's not talking about statistics, algebra, geometry, and all the other areas of mathematics. 
So to me, it's been surprising how critical and how relatively advanced the mathematics need to be to be an engineer. At the other end, remember I do global health. One thing that has consistently surprised me year after year is how ineffective donations are and how much people still donate. Just as one example, maybe for your own life, my wife and my children, we donate to a Goodwill all the time, our clothing, other things. I see people all the time donating to Goodwill. Buy the bag. So I got curious about, you know, is that really effective? Does that really work? Very simple measurement. I just sat in the parking lot for a day and counted how many bags of donations go in, how many bags of donations go out the front door, and how many bags go into the trash. 99% went into the trash. Less than 1% of the donations actually went to somebody who might actually need it. What a ridiculously inefficient system. I'm guessing 100% of the people who did the donation felt good about themselves, but in fact, the vast majority of those donations did absolutely no good. Didn't do some minor investigation about why, and most of it is because people are donating stuff that they wouldn't use themselves, like a broken toaster oven or a broken washing machine. If it's broken and it's not economical for you to fix it, of course it's not economical for a charity to fix it. So part of it is just, you know, people want to donate but don't really want to give away stuff that works. But part of it is just a terribly inefficient system. And this is throughout the world. The same exact problem with donations of clothing. If you walk around Africa, you'll see people wearing t-shirts from Duke University or whatever. Those were donations that were then packaged up and shipped off to Africa and sold to Africans in the marketplace. I took my daughter, we lived in Africa for a while, my daughter and I, and I took her to marketplaces that were selling donated stuff that clearly had been donated in less and that was appearing in marketplaces in rural Africa. What a crazy inefficient way to provide health to people. And it's surprising to me, this is really well documented. There's lots of really good movies and TED Talks and articles and books about how terrible the donation system is, but people still do it. They do it year after year after year. Well, thank you so much, Robert. This has been wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and I really appreciate your time today.